figured I had it pretty much whipped. And, and uh, when a good friend of mine introduced me to introduced me to Jay Burns, um, the first time I got to visit with him, and, and Gwen, my wife's telling me about this awesome ministry he's got going, and how he's really he's got he's got the same situation. The only difference is his kid's a great athlete. He's adopted. He's black. My kid was not a great athlete. He was natural and it's white. But other than that, we were very <laughs> identical, according to Gwen. Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah so, so I go and meet uh, Dr. Burns. It's what he wants me to call him. So I go and meet Dr. Burns, and he's a doctor. And so, this is a scientist. He's a doctor. Dr. Burns, I went to meet him, and he really didn't have anything for me. He was telling me all about this ministry and talking the way he does. I don't recall that he actually wept at that meeting, but um, I just remember going, dude, that guy's really messed up. He's He needs a ministry, but I'm good. I'm good. And uh, he, he describes it as I gave him the Heisman which foretold Johnny Manziel in 2009. Um, and, but I did. I just kind of put the stiff arm out, and I, I wasn't interested, and I wasn't ready. And it's kind of like if you go to share with, share the gospel with somebody, and you just give them a very clear, articulate revelation of truth, and they just go like, hey, pass the hot sauce. You know, they, they don't have ears to hear. And I didn't have ears to hear at the time. And when we get the Hastings up here, we'll probably drill in a little bit on what, what was that moment? What what was the situation that gave them years to hear? So uh, that's that's kind of how I got here. Cool. Wait, more why don't you come on up? Oh. You can carry the mic. And come up in the confidence knowing that nobody else wants to be you. <laughs> right. Come on. Uh, microphone on. Yeah. Uh, obviously, this is there, now you're live. Something I do very often. Wow, it's bright. This one's green. <laughs> Guys, thanks for coming. Thanks for being a part of Prodigal. Tell us a little bit of your Prodigal history. When did y'all start coming? What brought you here? Uh, give us the a uh, little bit more than the elevator version. But, uh. Okay. Uh, well, we've been coming since July 2016, so a little over a year. And the way that we ended up here was I was driving back from the attorney's office um, and stopped at Watermark Plano where we worship. And I just wanted to talk to somebody. And I'm a crier, so I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so I, I just stopped and I was like, is there anybody on staff that I can talk to? And I poured out her story of our son who was in jail um, for a very serious offense. And um, a young man and a young woman came down and took the time and listened to my story. Um, I shared all of it. I'm sure they walked away going, whoa. Um, but they said, you know what? There's probably two places within Watermark that might be good for you and your husband. And one of those was Prodigal, and the other was Regen. And um, I went home, and I hopped online, because we had only been at Watermark probably six months prior to that. And I hopped on and started just researching, and the next week we showed up at the doorsteps of Prodigal. <laughs> that was our first introduction to Larry. <laughs> he was in our open group. And we knew, you know, at that point, they say, Prodigal is full of the, well, I think I'm on. I'm, I'm clipped. Are you on? Well, I don't know. Am I on? Okay. <laughs> so that's when we learned that uh, all of you are the friends that we never wanted. And it's really true. I mean, none of us want to be here with the conditions that bring you to Prodigal, but you quickly do learn that the people that are here are gonna be great friends, great uh, people to, to fellowship with, and, um, just encourage and support you through this journey. And I will say that I showed up wanting this for my son, you need to hold not realizing that it was going to not have really anything to do with him. So um, I kind of quickly learned that. And um, so that was, that was an encouragement to me because it was about the Lord, the relationship between the Lord and myself and not necessarily about how am I going to fix my son, or how are we going to get him out of this mess that he's in? Mm -hmm. 
You know, I think back to the first aha moment uh, hearing Jay speak, whether it was 3D Jay, Jay or flat Jay. Um, what, was, what message or what principle jumped out and really caught you and said, you know, this is the right place because I needed to hear that? Can you, can you remember? For me, it was lazy, laying my Isaac down. Um, what does that mean? <laughs> it meant that I really had to let him go. I had to trust in the Lord to just be in control of Ryan. I had to step away from it and trust that God was on his throne and um, he would take care of Ryan and that um, he was giving me permission really to, to not be in control of that anymore. And uh, one of the books that Jay recommended was by Carol Kent, uh, When I Lay My Isaac Down. And um, I read it and mm -hmm. it was just a, a tremendous encouragement and support. And um, so for me, it was, it was laying your Isaac down. Yeah, that, for me it was really just understanding that I'm not in control, that God is in control. And I think most of us struggle with that as parents and the culture and growing up. It's, you know, you do this because you love your child. And in our case, our child is the prodigal. Um, but I'm not able to control it. And the situation that arose with him, um, he didn't commit a crime, but he was involved in... Um, Secret Service level <laughs> intervention. So um, it was a big deal. And that was God's way, I saw it as number one, taking our son and putting him in what I considered to be a hiding place for 10 months. And for us to finally have to come to the realization that we're not in control. It was suddenly the situation we had dealt with for 28 14, years. 14 years. Well, yeah, he's 28 or 29 now, but yeah, it started 14 years ago. Um, that was when it hit me that, okay, it, it's completely out of my control and I had to trust God with it. And then the other piece of it for me was really just understanding that coming to prodigal, like you mentioned earlier, the bait and switch, is God wants to have a relationship with you. You know, that he, he's interested in me as his child, as, you know, a child of God, and that's my relationship with him. And this prodigal experience was a distraction that was kind of a barrier between me and God. How many of y'all been through open group? All the way through open group? Raise your hand. Higher. Okay. So, you guys have been through open group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, five elements, five weeks of open group. Which week, which uh, of the open group modules really was the most helpful? and getting you prepared for what you're doing in close group? Well, I'm not, I can't really remember all the modules. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Okay, so for me, <laughs> I've gotta be honest, so. For me, it was the mission statement. And when I first heard that we were gonna have to write one, I was like, oh, great. Um, but it really did cause me to think about what is, an, what is an idol in my life that's a negative thing. And for me, it was fear. Um, and some may think it's weird to see fear as an idol, but I spent an awful lot of my time consumed by fear. And so that turned into my mission statement was basically to not shrink back into that fear, but to just proclaim, you know, the Lord's, goodness and his love and his protection over each one of us and um, from that point on you know I had always had 40, Isaiah 41.10 in my head I scrolled at night as I tried to go to sleep and, <laughs> but then I started looking at other scriptures that would encourage me with fear and, and start to move me away from thinking about it and trusting in, in what God's word had to say about that and so for me, it was the mission part of Open Group. Oh, share it. This isn't working. So I don't remember the five modules either, but I don't really want Larry whispering in my ear. So, Laura, would you like to would you like to tell me what they were? Uh, your story, uh, 
Yeah, the gospel, your mission. I didn't hear the last two. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to go with my story. Um, <laughs> Because honestly, from the time I was a small child, I've been surrounded by prodigals. And I didn't actually understand that until I came to prodigal. And I told Laura one night, I'm like, oh my gosh, my whole family is a prodigal. <laughs> and it's true, my parents were out of control, all of my siblings were out of control. I'm the youngest of five. And uh, I just remember you know, laying in bed at night, just praying to God for safety. Like I knew there was more to life than what I saw around me but I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know how to get it. Um, I just knew it was there. And so I just remember as a very young child, you know, praying that God would just protect me and show me goodness. And um, he has, and this has been a part of that. You know, the prodigal uh, program or, um, you know, outreach has been a phenomenal blessing to, to me and to our family. So uh, when y'all came here and we were an open group together, um, I remember you always sat in the same place. Everybody does that, right? Mm -hmm. And I was struck because at that time, Brian was still in jail. Yes. And you were going through a lot of the drama. And at that time, I didn't I didn't know the story. There's a sword involved or something. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I didn't know the story at the time, but I knew that you were going through something really, really difficult. I'm curious about, as you began to go through the process, how did you get to the point where you could hear could you do like a, a time overlay about where things began to take root and how did it change your interactions with Brian as you walked through the process? As you left every Tuesday night, were you able mm -hmm. to incorporate something in your relationship with Brian? You wanna go first? Yeah, no. go ahead. Okay, well first his name is Ryan. <laughs> Without yeah, the B. The first thing that goes <laughs> well, I didn't want to use yeah. those real names in the first place. Right. I was going to call okay. you Dan and Alice. Yeah. Because this is going to be on the worldwide web and I'm just trying to protect you. Right. Yeah. But okay. It's out Dan. there. Yeah. I'm, I'm wearing my name if anyone didn't know that. Anyway, um, that's why you're not in a true, like, protection that's role. That's <laughs> right. So what, what we learned or what I learned um, initially was just to let go of the control and immediately as we came to Prodigal, you know, week after week, there was more peace that came out of that chaos that I didn't have to control it. It wasn't up to me that, um, you know, God was in control and I had to trust him with that. And there's a huge burden that's lifted. There's a lot of freedom that comes with that realization of God is enough. And you know, whatever comes of this, we did what we needed to do to, you know, raise our son and bad choices have bad consequences and we're gonna just walk through this and, and see where it takes us. For me, it probably maybe six, well, probably more like eight weeks into it when we were finally able to get into closed group. Um, because that's where you really start to dig in. Um, that's where that support begins to really um, encourage. And I don't mean that as like, you know, this light little group that's hanging out together, but they're very honest and um, it really makes you stop and go, I've never said these things to my son before, or I've never mm -hmm. had those kind of boundaries with him before. And again, we were still in a situation where he was in jail but we were able to let him know that when he got out, that things were going to be different. And um, the other part of that, and it, it is part of my mission statement too, is to just live a peace and joy filled life. And that was a remarkable feeling. I think Wade mentioned that it was such a burden for it to lift, but once I could finally just let go of him, lay him down, to, to, to feel the kind of peace that I don't know when the last time was that I actually felt that kind of peace was just quite overwhelming. There is a, we witnessed a show of hands, there's a little bit less than half the audience has not been through open group as a whole. There, if you could paint a picture of, we use the word triage a lot as people coming in, paint a picture of the purpose of open group and what we try to accomplish in that. Well, the evolution of open group is we uh, set as a leadership 
team trying to figure out how to best equip folks and accelerate the conversations where we could all be speaking the same language at the same time when we get to the close group where the, where the work is really done. We kind of thought our first responsibility, we used really a medical, uh, an emergency room example because it just seemed to make a lot of sense. If you pictured yourself, we use an example, it's a little, it's a little indelicate, but a, if you walked into an emergency room with an ax sticking in your head, right? It's pretty obvious what's going on. When you show up here Tuesday night, we have a pretty good sense of what might be happening behind your door. But trying to assess really what is going on was part of what we wanted to do. So the, the open group function is to really to bring you in, recognize that you've got an ax stuck in your head. But we're basically there to check your insurance, make sure that you're in the right hospital, and that, that we can help you. And then we're going to equip you to speak the language that's going to be used in the rooms. And so when we go through those five modules, the first one that we talk about is really the, is, is Christ as the basis for our ministry and that we use uh, biblical truth to process the chaos. That's the very first thing. That's the foundation that, that we're going to lay for you. The second uh, module that we take you through is, is telling your story. And tonight I'm excited because that's what we'll be doing in our group later this evening, but it's important that you are able to go through the process and articulate your story. So many times we see folks come in here and they want to tell their prodigal story or they tell their family story or like Wade, you know, found out, hey, I've been surrounded <laughs> by folks all my life, but that's not, those guys aren't here, right? None of those prodigals are in this room. And so we want you to focus on your story. And the reason we do that is so that when you show up into the closed group community, you can accelerate an understanding of why you do what you do. Because when I start telling, if you know my story and I start talking to you about what I'm processing and what I'm walking through and where I'm struggling with my prodigal, if you remember things out of my environment or my history, you begin to understand why I do what I do and why I'm struggling the way I struggle. So that's part of that. Then conflict resolution is the third module, which is just an awesome tool. And we, you know, that one, if you don't learn anything else in product, we'll take the, the conflict resolution module, Matthew 18 model for dealing with conflict, and then always asking yourself, what is your responsibility? That is the most helpful tool that we can give you on the, on the quick down low. The fourth one is, the, is my favorite too, the personal mission statement, because if the story describes who you are when you get here, the mission statement describes really who you want to be, what you aspire to be. We talk about that's what you want folks to say about you at your funeral. It's how you want to live your life. And it begins to kind of put um, those gutter guards like in a bowling lane, you know, bowling alley. It puts those down so the ball stays in the alley. It also equips your closed group to be able to come alongside and remind you of your mission. I hated it when I first wrote my mission statement because the first one I shared it with was the first one to throw it back in my face. And that was my lovely wife, Gwen, who I didn't want to do something that I surely should have been doing according to my mission statement. She just said, well, what about your mission statement? <laughs> so now I encourage that behavior. You know, if you know somebody's mission statement, don't hesitate to pull it out and say, hey, I'm just trying to see how that lines up with your mission. And then finally, the fifth module is the plan questionnaire. We stress in, in the open group that we are not there to develop your plan. We ask you to give us five or six weeks of your time with the ax in your head. We're not, we're not pulling the ax out yet, okay? That's where the closed group is gonna go. So the triage process, where we kind of assess the damage, get you all settled in, get your vitals stabilized, but you still have an ax in your head. Don't be disappointed when you get into the closed group and, and they're all like, oh, you know, when they see your story for the first, no, they're not gonna do that. <laughs> but, but that's what we do. Does that answer your question? That's great. That's great. And by the way, we're going to have a brief opinion on how long we go uh, Q and A time. If you have a question to ask the panel, you're welcome to do that. And if you don't have some questions, I've got some right. Uh, awesome. All right. So you guys have been to open group. You have a mission statement. And mm -hmm. how would you describe your marriage and family dynamics before prodigal and after prodigal? What was that like? Okay, um, well, we've been married 32 years, and there have been lots of ups and downs, <laughs> lots of struggles, and lots of beautiful thing, beautiful times as well. But I was the, I would be described as the slow gazelle. Um, I'm the one that did more of the saving, or think that I thought that I was saving. Um, so I would the, go ahead. The uh, little tease is, prodigals are carnivores and they always pursue the slowest gazelle. 
to consume. So that's just the context of that. Yeah, sorry. If you go to my open group, you'll hear that story. Yeah, and ja I've heard Jace mention it a few times yeah. too. So I was the slow gazelle. I rescued more than than Wade would have ever thought of rescuing, but he just kind of allowed me to do it. Um, I would say most of our battles in the mar as a as a married couple were over our kids, primarily our prodigal, um, in in what he was able to do and not able to do. Uh, we have a younger son, eight years younger, who grew up observing a lot of those things and um, you know that was always a concern we were always very honest with him about what was going on um, what else did you want to know about them okay yeah I don't know if um, just because I'm the dad or if it was my upbringing which wasn't quite as lovey-dovey and caring but um, you know I was not as quick to swoop in and try to rescue but you know, in the environment and just again trying to, to do the rescue and the saving when actually that was God's job. Um, you know, we completed our task as parents and but we continued to try to think we could fix it. You know, one more rehab, one more, you know, court case, one more this, one more ticket, you know, whatever it was. We just continued to, you know, pour out the money and the time and the effort and the love. And um, one of the, the big ahas for me when we got here initially too was enabling. And you know, that was a, a huge, you know, slap in the face was, of course we've been enabling. That's what all those things are. You're continuing to support their behavior and that activity. And, you know, it's kind of foolish because you're getting the same outcome over and over again and you keep doing the same thing. So, not a lot of uh, wisdom in that. Would you say y'all were on the same page in your marriage when y'all came? <clears throat> or were we all kind of different pages? When we came here? Yes. Um, I would say that we were absolutely on the same page when we came here. In fact, when Ryan was arrested, we didn't know if he had, or get, if we were going to get a phone call that Saturday if he had committed suicide or been killed by law enforcement. And we sat out on mm -hmm. the patio and we prayed together and we asked God to protect our marriage because we knew if anything could mm -hmm. tear us apart that this was going to be it. And um, so honestly, from the time that he was arrested to coming through prodigal, we, we honestly have had a stronger marriage and are more on the same page today than we ever have been with our kids. Yeah, the, I'm just gonna touch on that, that last part about the weekend when it was actually her birthday. <laughs> when he decided to pull the stunt and um, it was very tough thinking, you know, maybe he was going to take his life or maybe you know, he wouldn't be alive the next day and we didn't know where he was and we're frantically texting and whatnot. Um, and the one of the harder parts for me, for other people that kind of come from troubled families where you've kind of grown up around it, you've experienced it, you've done it, um, it's a different level of kind of pain and uh, when you see it in your children because you want the best for your kids you you know have done everything you can to support them and love them and encourage them and when you see Satan's grip on them and know that you can't do anything about it um, you know it's humbling and so if any of you are still struggling with that um, it's it's very hard when you've been around it your whole life and then you see it in your child and so I've been very prayerful for God to just you know change that to break that chain and um, during this process, I've become, I think, more apologetic with my sons. Um, I know Larry thinks I'm perfect, but I'm actually not. <laughs> so I do have to apologize now and again to uh, my wife and to my children when I behave in a way that's not godly or not Christ-like. And that would have been something I never would have done you know, prior to coming to Prodigal. I have a question, because Wade, you use the term love or loving. Brian, a.k.a. Ryan, yes. a couple different times, and, and as I think about that, I'm just curious, understanding what you believe loving him looked like mm -hmm. before your prodigal experience and afterwards, so much of our life and as prodigals, with prodigals as a rearview mirror experience, looking back on that, has your definition changed of what loving mm -hmm. Ryan is, loving him well is? Yeah, absolutely. There's... Um, uh, there was a quote, we started, 
prodigal in July, mm -hmm. I think. And it was actually in the first lesson in July, um, and I don't recall the, the gentleman's name that the quote was from, but it basically said that, you know, when you're constantly intervening and not allowing someone to, to hit rock bottom or to actually rely on God, that you're actually stealing that blessing from them. You're potentially um, derailing their salvation, the opportunity for them to get to know Christ and to get to know God. Um, that stuck out very much for me in that um, you know, I'm, I'm interfering in God's will or God's purpose for my son. And I need to just step back, let him control it, you know, lay down my Isaac and let that be between him and God. I don't know that there's that much more to add, but you know, love is a verb. And um, I just think my idea of loving him was, was really trying to save him from all of the things that he, um, did to destroy you know his own life experiences and had i had the opportunity to do it again and i still believe i do even at the age of 29 i i think there are still things that we can we can teach him through and love him through is through discipline that i never um thought about using with him when he was younger at least certain kind of disciplines that we've learned um in here mm -hmm. One of the, our objectives when we get into close group is to help you put together a plan. And we define a plan by basically boundaries and consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal is to get your life back. It's not to fix your problem. Mm -hmm. So in your plan, the one you all put together, what were your biggest obstacles? And this is going to be my last question or next to the last question because of time. What were your biggest battles in that, in that process of putting that plan together? Well, again, when we started doing the plan, our son was in jail. So it was a little bit different situation, but we knew when he got out that he was either going to come home with us or we were going to try to find a facility, so something like Men of Nehemiah, where he could go and you know further get support and discipline and things that he needed. Um, he ended up coming home with us and we set specific boundaries about what he could and couldn't do. He didn't have money. We did, we do support him, you know, still with gas and things like that because he went through a lot of, um, gosh, a lot of um, mental health uh, testing and things like that. And we did discover that there were some physical physical things in his brain that, that had happened, but um, we, we basically just set boundaries of what he could and couldn't do, and, and trust me, at the age of 29, it's not easy to tell your son who's living at home with you that you can and can't do certain things, and, um, but he, he is living at home with us right now. He has remained within those boundaries, he has been clean. Um, his psychiatrist uh, drug tests him. Um, he goes to Regen. So there were a lot of things that we, you know, suggested that he do once he got home. Um, and we had told him that if he did not remain within those boundaries, that he would be uh, finding someplace else to go. So. So he's checking the boxes. He's doing what you ask. Mm -hmm. How's his heart? Um. His heart, if what I see, and, and those of you that are mothers, you know you can look into your kids' eyes and you can tell whether something's right or wrong. And um, I've been able to look into his eyes. He is clear. His heart um, is more on fire for the Lord. And, and don't get me wrong, he's always had a relationship with the Lord, but it's been from a place that's very, that has not been from discernment. Um, mm -hmm. He got caught up in Old Testament um, history, and, and it really, he, he kind of got a warped brain from some of it. But the 10 months of being in, a, in, being in jail without drugs, without alcohol, um, really forced him to take a long look at his life. Um, he read his Bible while he was there, and he's come out, and, and he has a, 
a much more sensible, peaceful heart in the Lord. Before, I think it was kind of hard for him. He honestly felt like he was a, a warrior for the Lord, but it was twisted in a in a dark kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, now he has a an audio Bible that he uses in his car. Um, he asked for a new Bible because his old Bible had a lot of writing in it that reminded him of where he had been and he wanted a new Bible to start over again. Um, don't get me wrong, I know that this is a day-by-day -day walk. <laughs> I um, don't, you know, try to think ahead. I just take today for what it is and um, I'm so thankful and grateful that that he is where he is right now. Mm -hmm. Let me touch on something that you said because you talk about the dynamic and Jim's asking about your plan and what you guys have done, but the dynamic of having your product back in the home, number one goal is, is we're always trying to encourage people to always have a way for them to come back home. That doesn't necessarily mean that they move back in home, but that you've restored a relationship where you have that intimacy and you, mm -hmm. you, you gain that back. Mm -hmm. But you talked about one of the things that is most difficult, and I think probably everyone here has, has struggled with it, and it's like, okay, I go to this place every Tuesday night, and all they talk about is how enabling I am. And, and you can't begin to understand what's really healthy behavior. And part of the, the closed group dynamic is really based on the principle in Galatians 6, and you'll hear Jay talk about it in the lecture about the, the principle of reaping and sowing, but the, the principle is bear one another's burdens, but then a couple verses down it says everybody's got to carry their own load, right? And so what you're talking about, some of those things are burdens, and then you have to be able, as, as a parent in that situation, to be able to discern what's a burden and what's a load. Because when you start getting into the load side of things, that's where you start getting into the enabling side of things, and that's where a closed group comes into play. That's where the plan comes into play because you've got to begin to process those with biblical community. People will tell you the truth and been where you've been, but understand how to answer those questions. And sometimes doing, you know, giving your son money may be a, a bearing a burden in that situation or circumstance for you, but it could very much be a load in somebody else's life. So you have to get in that group and process it biblically and don't be afraid to ask the question mm -hmm. and what do you think about what I'm doing here because that's what the plan dynamics all about mm -hmm. really so y'all implemented boundaries and consequences <clears throat> tell the group what impact that had on changing Ryan's heart Brian Ryan right <laughs> Ryan <laughs> Ryan's heart <laughs> what impact <laughs> <your> boundaries <laughs> and consequences had on him and what did they have on well, I, I think that, um, you know, when, when we enforced the boundaries, he understood that we were pretty much, after coming here and learning what we've learned, that we were, we were done. I mean, it's like, if you can't do the things that we're telling you to do, then there's this great place we've heard about called Men and Nehemiah that was going to be our go-to, I think, or at least try to, to get him in there. And we shared all that with him while he was still in jail. It's like, you know, if you can't do this and you can't live by our rules and you can't try to straighten things out in your life, then, you know, you're not going to live in our home. You're not going to, we're not going to continue to just facilitate this behavior. So here's where you're going to go. And I think he also, this was the first time he had actually been incarcerated. Um, and he got a taste of that and it was like, whoa, you know, it's, I don't think I want to do this. You know, I don't want to be here. And so it finally caught up to him, and I think God used that to, to help change his heart. Um, you know, he actually, for the first time that I've noticed, he will say things about small blessings in his life, you know, something that he saw or something that, um, you know, was in nature or something that he had, had eaten that day that was really good or, you know, just little things that a lot of us take for granted. He began to appreciate and see his blessings. Um, as far as in our life and our household, it's the chaos is almost gone, not completely. But um, I mean, there's just so much more peace in living this way and in trusting God and seeing His growth. You know, moving in a relationship towards God um, that's rewarding for us. And then I know that my relationship with God has gotten stronger since my time, um, you know, coming to Prodigal, which has been about a year and four months. Um, 
so just all in all, it's he can take, you know, I, I think you, if you haven't heard it, you'll hear it here at some point, but God takes your mess and makes it a message. And um, I believe that, you know, we have our own message, but I, I believe that our prodigal has one of his own to tell at some point in, in his life. I'll make one statement, Larry, and I'll let you close us off. But uh, one of the things that's important is when we implement boundaries, we encourage you to put boundaries and consequences into your prodigal situation. We're under no illusion that those boundaries and consequences are going to change your prodigal's heart. That's God's work. Mm -hmm. You know, Philippians 2.13, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God is the one that will woo your prodigal back, will put that spark of faith and bring him back into a relationship with him. Boundaries and consequences, which we encourage you to, to do, are for you as parents or spouses, if your prodigal is a spouse, to get your life back. Because our prodigals take us out of the game. Mm -hmm. They make us isolate. And so this is what this is all about. So uh, boundaries and consequences are not for your prodigals, though it impacts them greatly. Mm -hmm. uh, they're for you. So. And just follow up on that. It, you know, most of us are dealing with adult age or older prodigals. Uh, I would say teenagers and up. And so the issue of boundaries and consequences is always one of conflict for us. And if you think about it, that boundaries are really more your responsibility and consequences. Once your children get a little bit older, you, you don't have to be as responsible about creating consequences as much as you need to be willing to allow the consequences to, to take their course. And I think that's one of the things we struggle with most, and, and we dress that up as loving our prodigal by protecting them from the consequences, but one time I had a lady saying, man, I, I just want consequences. You know, she was just really frustrated with the process because nothing was changing in her daughter, and our message to her basically was, well, then just take one step to the right. You know, just step out of the way. Because those consequences are there and they're God authored. And the longer you delay that process, the more severe those consequences become. That's the most exhausting thing we do as parents of prodigals is creating consequences and enforcing consequences. We encourage you, keep these plans very simple. Don't make your prodigal's plan for them, make your plan and keep them very simple. Because we're trying to get out of the business of creating consequences which escalates conflict and it becomes more and more exhausting. Step back, step out of the way, let God do His work as His design. And you'll see each week through the lectures, Jay's going to reveal godly principles that reinforce that. And uh, so we're just grateful that you guys are here. I think one thing that's really important is y'all go to your close groups tonight is to remember how important it is that you are here and that you are doing the work and that you are faithful that you are participating, and that you're loving on folks just like the Hastings. Because every one of us needs the rest of us at some point in the journey. I may be in a really good place on my prodigal journey right now, but I'm not out of the woods. And while I might be able to bear a burden with you for a little while, I'm probably going to need you to bear one for me sooner or later. So we've all got to be equipped, and we all have a job to do. And the last part, just to go back to the medical example, the accident in your head kind of thing, once you get the axe out of your head and you get in a closed group and you begin to walk, the, the, the structure, the strategy for us always was that you leave the hospital, right? I mean, we've all been in hospitals probably. Who wants to stay there? I mean, I could never find the exit, right? You want to get out of there. And so the strategy or the thought process is that, that, that there is an exit to community. And so the last question, I don't know if we had enough time, but, you know, the, the Hastings were approached about joining the leadership team and that's always been our view and vision one of the biggest problems we have is we just don't have enough leaders and so if we do this right and you go through triage you get the axe out of your head and you start to heal up you gotta leave the hospital sometimes leaving the hospital means you sit in a leader's chair instead of a participant's chair and we don't want anybody to ever be afraid of that process because i like that mess and message thing it's, i've never heard that before but you do have a message and don't make the mistake of thinking that God didn't love you a whole lot to allow whatever tragedy is befallen you because He loves you that much. But He wants to use that. He wants to Romans 8.28 that and bring it around and, and put it in a position of service for others. So think about that as you continue to go. You continue to loop the curriculum. Hey, is it time for me to maybe take and invest 
some of this back. Maybe you do it at Starbucks on a weekend. Maybe you end up getting in a formal leadership role with us. If you ever want to talk to anybody about that, talk to Jim. He's the boss on that. But just, <laughs> just let us know if you're ever curious about it. And then maybe one day you'll be sitting up here in these really hot, bright white lights, you know, sitting in front of a bunch of people you never wanted as your friends and uh, telling, them, <laughs> telling your story. So thank you guys for being here tonight. Thank you for being willing to do the work, to tell your truth, and, and to share your story and, and to be available to us. I'll just, uh, well, oh, I got to clarify something because, you know, we're trying to minimize chaos around here. And Jim said tonight and next week are the last meeting. That's really confusing me. I've, I've been on chemo. Next week is the last meeting for the year. Not tonight and next week are the last meeting. <laughs> Semantics. Okay, so next week, you only need to remember one thing. Next week is our last meeting. Not tonight and next week. Just, it's the Alabama man. I don't know. It's next week is the last meeting. Right? So roll that, Ty. Okay. <laughs> Turn Jim's microphone off. And I'll say, <laughs> hey, mind the newcomers where to go. Oh, newcomers. Do we have any newcomers? I didn't see any hands. Oh, well, good. Welcome. I'm glad y'all are here. You go sit back there. See, see where all those people are back there? <laughs> Did y'all bring the snack? Uh, I'm sorry, they didn't bring sandwiches tonight. You should have been here last week. <laughs> anyway, that's snacks and stuff for Thanksgiving, maybe. Anyway, newcomers, back to the back corner. Uh, you should know where you're going in open group, and then the rest of you know where your closed groups are. So thank you for being here tonight. I look forward to getting to know you guys. We'll pray and be dismissed. Father, we're just grateful for the Hastings, for the story that you're writing through way more, and for their willingness just to sit and to share uh, their experiences and, and really what you have taught them uh, all along the way. And I'm just so encouraged to hear that simple things like our marriage is better than it's ever been as a result of the difficulty that they face. And Father, that's something that you've authored. You have truly caused all things to work together for the good of the Hastings. And we're grateful for that. We're thankful for the truth of your word and the chance just to sit and share that tonight. We just ask that you bless the remainder of our evening together, that we honor you in our conduct and our conversation, and that we encourage one another as we leave this place. We thank you for it, Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.